Morning everybody and welcome to On The Couch today. Our guest today is a psychologist who works with organisations, groups, individuals, couples and families on relationships, well-being, stress, mental health, career development, leadership, change, life transition and job loss, all of which is completely and utterly relevant to everybody at the moment. Um, she's also the resident psychologist and social commentator on Channel 7's morning show and the Daily Edition. She also does some work with 3AW and she's worked across corporate and government departments around Australia as a speaker, spokesperson, facilitator and content creator. So a very warm welcome to Sabina Reid and thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you Anne, it's so great to be here even though it feels like you're a long way away. I know, right? <laughs> and I'm loving the uh, colour coordination that we've got going on today. I got the pink memo. <laughs> you did. Yes, I love the pink memo. <laughs> awesome. So let's just sort of start off with, you know, what did you want to do and be when you were growing up and how did you end up where you are today? So I think in my later years, I mean, when I was a young child, I had similar dreams like a lot of kids, um, you know, vets and flight attendants and interior designers and things. But as I became older, um, I, I have told this story before that when I was 17 and I was a school leaver and my mum still reminds me that I said to her, I think I would like to be a psychologist, but I don't want to listen to people's problems all the time, which sounds so counterintuitive because you think that that's all a psychologist should be doing. Yeah. Um, in hindsight, I think I realised that that was really quite intuitive and insightful commentary from my 17-year-old self because I didn't want to listen to people's problems all day and I still don't right. as a psychologist. But at the time, I didn't know how to make that work. I only knew about the medical model that, was very, that psychology was very couched in, which was about looking at what's not working, what are people struggling with, what's the deficit, yeah. the broken sort of perspective, which is very much what the medical model is aligned to. You yep. break your bone, you fix the bone, and that's that's how you serve people's needs. Yep. So I went off and deviated in, uh, changed career paths completely, and I did a communications degree, worked in public relations and comms um, yeah. for, yeah, you know, eight, nine years, yeah, okay. and then circled back to psychology. So what did I want to be when I grow up as a psychologist, but I didn't want to be it at 17, but I got there in the end. Yeah, right. <laughs> And then when you were sort of doing your marketing and everything, what sort of, was there sort of like a pivotal point where you wanted to, okay, actually, I really want to go back to the psychology. What, what happened or what changed? Yeah, there, there was. So I was working at the Body Shop head office in PR, which is based in Melbourne. Yep. The Australian New Zealand head office was here, is here. And I found myself spending so much time, A, thinking about the values and purpose and meaning of the work that I was doing, and that's what yeah. drew me to the body shop. They were really trailblazers in the space of values-led business. They were yeah. about um, saving the environment, not testing on animals, indigenous and human rights. So I deliberately went and sought out this job knowing that it was lighting my fire with regards to, to values. Yeah. But when I was there, I spent so much time listening to what everyone was doing around me and thinking, that team's not getting along with that team. I don't think that that leader has made sense of what you know that employee needs most from them. Yeah. So that was one experience that okay. was a catalyst, is yeah. that I was in this sort of organisational space, but thinking through a psychological lens. Yeah. And the other thing that happened is the Body Shop was very good with their employees about giving us an opportunity to volunteer okay. on the company pay time. Yep. So I decided to sign up um, for a life, as a lifeline counsellor, which okay. was very rigorous okay. in its training. It took a year, a year of training and then I worked on the phones for, I probably did that for four years in the end, I think. Right. But it was the beginning of that was because of the offering in, in my workplace. Yeah. So that was also, I would, I would work in PR by day, but then I would work in the, in the call centre as a lifeline volunteer phone counsellor. And this is decades ago, many yeah, right. decades ago. And I think that gave me a really sound insight into what people are dealing with, the levels of loneliness, the despair, yeah. the mental health issues that people experience. And both of those both of those parts put together, it made me think, it's time, I've done my PR gig, yeah. it's time to go back. And just, you know, if you, if you reflect back on the work that you were doing as a counsellor with Lifeline, mm. Um, have you seen that sort of that whole support network change over a period of time? 
look, in some ways, no. I mean, I think uh, one of the changes that we're seeing now, and we'll probably talk about it later, is yeah. that um, telehealth and phone and video is now taking a hold, not yeah. just in the psych sector and the yeah. um, professional, uh, the mental health sector, but in, in all sectors. Yeah. And yet, that was phone work that I was doing in the in the mid '90s. Yeah, right. Um, and I think we really have a capacity to be able to share and engage without face-to-face -face contact. I feel really confident about that. Okay. And those, exp those years with Lifeline was very affirming for yeah. that. that even though these were people, and of course Lifeline, it's anonymous, it's confidential, yep. and it's a one-off contact. Um, you don't ever ask to speak to the same person again, so you don't know what's going to happen to those people. But in that moment, I've, I felt so present and so with the people on the phone, and I don't know, I don't know anything but a, you know, a first name and the story they're telling. And even without the face-to-face -face contact, I felt there was still very, a very deep sense of connection and yeah. affinity. Okay. So given everything that's going on in the world at the moment, you are no doubt incredibly busy. <laughs> so how are you managing at the moment during everything that's going on? Yeah, and first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge that I feel really blessed and lucky to be working in, in a job um, and in a career that still allows me to be busy at this time because I think it's important to recognise that that's not everyone's experience. Yep. Um, but yes, as a mental health professional, I think there's you know no shortage of work. And my work's really varied. So I, I do clinical work one-on-one. -on -one. I, I have a room with a couch, yep. although I'm not using my room or my couch at the moment, I'm doing the telehealth thing. Yep. And I'm also doing walking um, sessions with clients. Oh, lovely. Which has been wonderful. It's something I've wanted to do for a long time. And That's I know that there's... Some walking sort of therapy in in the states, yeah. um, but the other day I was walking with a client, and it was raining. So we each had big golf umbrellas, which allowed us the social distancing. <laughs> so I thought this is all working perfectly. <laughs> um, it's raining, and our umbrellas are big. We're social distancing. We're getting exercise. We're not breaking the rules, and we're still in this therapy space. So. Yeah. Um, I'm always looking for, you know, how do we make things work? How do we be creative and passionate and innovative at the same time? But how am I making it work? Mm -hmm. I wanted to share something, if I can. I wanted oh, to read fantastic. something and then I can speak to it yeah, um, afterwards. Mm -hmm. So let me just read and then I'll give it some context. And people stayed at home and read books and listened and they rested and they did exercises and made art and played and learned new ways of being and stopped and listened more deeply. Someone meditated, someone prayed, someone met their shadow and people began to think differently and people healed. And in the absence of people who lived in ignorant ways, dangerous, meaningless and heartless, the earth also began to heal. And when the danger ended and people found themselves, they grieved for the dead and made new choices and dreamed of new visions and created new ways of living and completely healed the earth just as they were healed. Now, this is a beautiful piece of prose. It sounds like it was written today. It was actually written in 1919 during the Spanish flu pandemic. Oh, wow. And what I love about this Actually, it was written in 18, uh, it says it was written in, I think it was written in 1869, it says. But anyway, it's a, it's a story of a pandemic in another time, but the experience is the same. Exactly the same. And we keep hearing now that um, we're, in, we're in unprecedented times. Yep. We're on a journey. Yep. We have to pivot. We have to find new ways. We keep having these conversations, yep. but in some ways, human behavior is the same as it's always been. We have lived through times of great fear yep. and uncertainty and not knowing. Mm -hmm. And the things that we come back to in answer to your question and how am I dealing with this time are the things that we've always had in our toolkit. Yep. They're not super complex. Mm -hmm. They're not, how did I not hear about that? I never got the memo. Mm -hmm. They are the things written there, which is about spending time reflecting and exercising and uh, writing and art and thinking and meditating and the things in our toolkit have always been there. Yeah. And I think sometimes we look for something 
some miraculous answer. We look at a time like this for certainty yep. when there is none. Correct. And so I think one of the things that's important at this time is to find ways to tolerate the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about some analogies. I often think in pictures in my work. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that we're kind of hardwired to want to solve and fix and find answers. Um, and we want to know where the finish line is. Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, okay. today, getting here, I put in Google Maps the address and it tells you to the minute what time you'll arrive. Yep. And that's, that's very um, calming. Comforting. Yep. Comforting. Yep. I, put it, I put in the data and I know when I'll arrive. I can surrender. I can let go. That's taken care of. Yep. Um, when we're a child, we might have an advent calendar counting down till Christmas. And we know that in those days in December, by the time we get to the 25th, it's Christmas, we've arrived yeah. at the end goal. But when we're living with the complexities and uncertainties of COVID-19, there's no advent calendar, there's no Google Maps, mm -hmm. and yet that's what everyone's looking for. That's so true. They're saying, how can I find the answer? Where, the question everyone is asking, when is this gonna be over? Yeah. And I don't think that's a helpful question to ask ourselves. I think, you know, like we, we talked a little bit about this the other day, you know, people are either very, you're either black and white, you know, if you're black and white, you sort of tend to be very process driven and okay, I know exactly what I'm doing, I know exactly where I'm going and now we're living in this world of grey mm -hmm. and so everybody, like you said, is looking for an answer. So, you know, I get asked, you know, all the time, how long do you think this is going to go on for? When do you think this is going to end? What does this actually look like? And, you know, the answer is I have no idea and nobody does. And, you know, well, what's the plan and what are we going to do? And so people, like you said, are looking for this certainty and they can't be given it. Mm -hmm. So how, what would you, what's your advice in that space? How do people manage in sort of and exist in the grey yeah. for whatever period of time it might be? Yes, of which, as you say, no one knows. So yeah. we know in basic, you know, stress terms that yeah. we go into the fight or flight response when we're responding to uncertainty and stressful events. And that's what we're in most certainly now. Yeah. And when we're in that stress, uh, in that fight or flight mode, um, we have been designed to be in fight or flight for very short moments of time. So I always go back to the saber-toothed tiger. The saber-toothed tiger's at your heels. Either you're going to turn around and try and attack the tiger in, in order for it to not become a threat anymore, yeah. or you're going to run from the tiger, run up a tree and wait till the tiger moves on. Yeah. And when our body does that, certain things happen, like our digestion shuts down, pupils dilate, all these things happen to us in order for us to just deal with the stressor in that moment. Right. That's adaptive, that's healthy stress management. Okay. What we're dealing with now is thousands of saber-toothed tigers uh, and they, they're surrounding us. Whether um, in our minds or in reality, it's this constant level of stress that we're all feeling. Mm -hmm. And so in order to deal best with that stress, we need to be able to circuit break that stress so that we get back down to, I call it my banana lounge. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm not literally in a bikini with a cocktail, <laughs> um, but when I'm on my banana lounge, it's those little incremental moments throughout the day that the saber tooth tiger's not present. Yep. And that's what I think the call to action is for all of us at this time. Okay. We can't control, we don't have the answers, we don't know when the end game is and we don't know what's going to happen to us along this experience in this journey. But what we can control is the times that we get back to the banana lounge throughout the day. Yep. And by that, I literally mean two minutes of meditation, yep. five minutes of laughter, a conversation with a loved one, a conversation with a friend. Mm -hmm. These moments throughout the day, and they're not complex, they're not rocket science, mm -hmm. but these allow us to get back on our banana lounge just temporarily, mm -hmm. and we can't be on our banana lounge and running from the saber-toothed tiger at the same time. So rest, sleep, humour, exercise, um, and social connection, they're little building blocks, but they, they can't exist at the same time as we're running or fighting or flighting. Yeah, right, okay. Um, so there'll be a lot of people out there that will really be struggling in terms of mental health that have potentially never faced it before. So in, just in terms, what would your advice be in terms of how do people go about accessing it or if they need support, 
Where do they go and what does that actually look like for people that have never been in this space before? Yeah, it's a really good question. I've actually written an article about this, so maybe we can even post it somewhere which gives more fantastic. detail about how to find a psychologist. Yep. But in short, um, the research tells us that it is the rapport between a client and a therapist or a patient and a psychologist that is the most important ingredient in efficacy in therapy. Right. So it's not how long the person has been practicing or what modality they practice through, but the rapport between the two people. Do you get me? Do you understand me? Do you see me? Can I relate to you? Yeah. So I think that's a really important takeaway for people because we're often sort of thinking, but who's this person that can help me and, and how will I know if they're the right one? It's kind of like dating in a way. Yeah. And um, it really is, you know, follow your gut. What does it feel like when you're with this person? Yeah. Big trust element in there a as well. Very big trust element. That's become even more complex now in COVID-19 because um, a lot of this is now being done through what's being labelled telehealth, which is either phone or computer counselling. So you might never get to physically meet each other, yeah. which could be challenging for a new therapy relationship. Mm -hmm. But in order to find a psychologist, I think the best port of call, three things. Um, your GP mm -hmm. is a good resource. They know they're hearing from other patients. You know, I found this person really helpful or, or not. Yeah. So that's a, a good <laughs> reference, a referral source. The Australian Psychological Society, which is uh, my membership body, yep. has an online finder psychology service. So you punch in, um, you know, relationship counselling in Caulfield and you'll get people who okay. both geographically and by um, issue come mm -hmm. up. And the other is word of mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope... I hope that seeing a psychologist is not the taboo that it once was, you know, mm -hmm. um, that, that people are able to say, I found seeing such and such really helpful and I think she or he would be good for your issue as well. Yeah. So um, they're good starting points. It's important for people to know that just this week, actually, um, the government is now offering a Medicare rebate for phone and um, Tele. telehealth. And that's yeah. never that's never occurred in the history of Australian mental health. So that's fresh that's off fantastic. the press this week. And that means that it's far more accessible for everyone to be able to access. So I would say, if you think now's the time, don't delay, jump on in, see what the experience feels like. Always, I think it's appropriate, I always say to my um, clinical clients, I'm happy to have a, a short conversation on the phone beforehand to see what it feels like, what yeah. it feels like for you. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. So in your actual profession, do you see, given everything that's going on, any significant changes that will take place? I mean, I know in terms of, you know, I suppose the government has recognised the fact that there is going to be significant mental health challenges coming out the other end of this or as, as, it, as, as it is now. Um, and with the teleconferencing and all that, do you see anything else changing within the profession? Aside from the practical and the technological, I don't think, and I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but I don't think we've seen the half of it yet. Right. Um, I think at the moment we're sort of still in this embryonic phase of not really knowing what this new normal looks like. Yep. We're working from home. For some people, there's even been kind of a novelty factor there. I mean, I think I mentioned to you a meme that I thought was funny that talked about taking your jammies off at 8 p.m., your daytime jammies to put your nighttime jammies on because we're all, you know, underdressing as we're working from home. So there's been sort of a novelty factor. For some people, I don't have to commute. I can see my family more often. But those, that novelty factor is starting to already become more and more challenging for some people. Yeah. And as we said, we don't know how long this is going to last. I think we haven't seen anything yet as far as mental health um, considerations go. I was reading that in China, the divorce rates have already skyrocketed. Oh. And it's no surprise to me that um, people's relationships, if they were already on rocky ground or experiencing some real pressure points in the relationship, yeah. that then being in lockdown with a partner who you're struggling with and perhaps don't have the tools to navigate that yeah. is going to magnify yeah. those issues. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think the long-term ramifications psychologically and emotionally are pretty significant yeah, here okay. and I think the mental illness rates are going to rise. We know already domestic violence rates are on the up. Mm. Alcohol use is on the increase. So um, 
I don't think it's a pretty picture ahead for us as in my industry. Yeah, right. I know that's heavy. <laughs> that's heavy going. It is. Do you want me to? Can I? Can I ha hand up something that might counteract that or balance That'd be that? Lovely. One of the things I think you and I talked about on the phone was um, advice that's been potent or powerful or useful for me. Yep. And something that I might share. And my favourite, favourite quote of all time, I think, is more relevant now than ever. Mm -hmm. It was written by Viktor Frankl, who survived um, the Holocaust and living in a concentration camp and seeing those around him who he loved murdered. And he became a psychiatrist and he wrote Man's Search for Meaning, which is a well-known book. Mm -hmm. And the quote that I love of his is that between stimulus and response is space. Yep. So between things happening to us yep. and our response is this space. Yep. And in this space is our power to choose. Yep. And in that choice is our growth and freedom. Yep. When you think about That's those beautiful. words in, in the context of the Holocaust, it's mm -hmm. harrowing. But those words, I think, ring true now more than ever for all of us. Things are happening to us. Horrific things are happening for some people they and are. they're out of our control. Yeah. But what we can choose, or what we are in control of, is the way we choose to respond. Yeah. And um, I think that's really empowering. I think that's empowering for every one of us that we have a choice how we respond to each other, how we soothe ourselves, how we create a healing in the world, which was written about during the Spanish yeah. flu pandemic. Yeah. We have got more choices and when we're feeling helpless and powerless, I think sometimes we lose sight of the choices that we have. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So I suppose one question for you is, so what's one thing that you will never take for granted again? <laughs> um, you know, on a serious level, touch. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a very tactile person and even do, coming I, in today, I, know, right? I went to reach out because I love touching people yeah. in appropriate ways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when you see someone, you know, I had an experience at the supermarket or at the fruit shop, people were lining up outside the fruit shop. It was a new um, initiative at, at my fruit shop yeah. and they were giving out gloves and this whole experience. And I saw a woman line up outside the store and then she became really teary and I saw her crying. And then when I got my turn, put my gloves on, went into the fruit shop and then I saw her in there and I said, are you okay? I saw you were really upset. And she said, I just feel like we're all, everyone's the enemy. I feel like everyone's the enemy because we can't, yeah. we can't touch. We're not looking at each other. She's missing the connection. Missing the connection. It was so palpable seeing her emotion. And I said, I don't, I, I, you know, I could see your pain and I want to reach out to you. And I want to say to you that I think we're not the enemy. Actually, it's, it's a way that we're trying to show and express love for yeah. each other, for ourselves, for our most vulnerable and for our society at large. Yeah. So there's sort of a reframe there, I think, that we're doing this from a place, I don't want to be happy clappy, but we're doing this from a place of compassion, yeah, not fear. Yeah. That's the, that's the lens I choose to look, look at it through. So mm -hmm. that's my touch is what I miss most. Yep. More facetiously or on a lesser <laughs> level, uh, I miss dancing because I like going to parties and dancing. Right. And even more um, superficially, I miss getting my nails painted. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> it so, took me forever to work out how to get the SNS off. <laughs> well, I'm just a simple out of a bottle gal. No SNS, no shellac. But I just, I do oh, like... Simple things. Yeah, simple things. Yeah. So I've been painting my own nails, painting my kids' nails and um, touching people I'm allowed to touch and dancing nice. people I'm allowed to dance with. Beautiful. Actually, Leah in our office is a mad dancer. So maybe when we're all back up and running, you oh, two yeah. can have a dance yeah, off we'll together. We'll get a podium. Yeah. podium together. Um, we've got uh, lots of questions coming in. So I might just move to some questions. Sure. Um, so what skills can you suggest for managing confinement? Yes, confinement. Even, Confin the, even the word <laughs> feels like it's, it's joking. You. Yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> um, so actually, the language we use is very powerful in how we experience our lives. And yeah. I think thinking about the word <laughs> um, lockdown and confinement is very constraining. We feel very restricted. Yeah. So I think we need to maybe find some other ways to, to refer to it. But I think that is most challenging for two ends of the spectrum. 
One is living with other people is challenging mm -hmm. because autonomy is a very important construct in our lives. Mm -hmm. Privacy is an important experience. Being the master of our sort of own domain is really important to all of us. And suddenly, no matter how much we love the people we're living with, we feel this sense of lost autonomy and lost privacy. So I think one of the things that's important if we're living with other people is to find ways to honour that privacy and that autonomy while still connecting and sharing with others. But may I also answer that question by acknowledging that some people in lockdown are living alone. Yeah. So their experiences of the challenge as, are, are not how do I find privacy and autonomy, but how do I tolerate the aloneness that I feel? Yeah. And not having someone at the end of the day to have a conversation with face to face is really important. So um, the first step in, in coping with anything is at least acknowledging it before we start to look for a solution. And, and normalising, I'm really big on normalising that Every experience that we have might be unique. The way mm. we approach life, our personality and our style might be quite unique to us. But what we share, and I know for sure, is the universal emotions we experience. We want to feel connected. We mm. want to feel accepted. We mm. want to feel loved. We want to feel seen. And how we go about doing that is different for each of us. Yeah. But the end game is what we all deeply desire. So that's important to acknowledge that in how we go about meeting our own needs and the needs of others while we're in lockdown. Okay. Um, Self-care is the catchword at the moment. Do you have any specific suggestions? Yeah, so I talked about getting back on the banana lounge throughout the day. Yep. And I think um, we talked about some of those things. Exercise is paramount. It always has been. Um, I have concerns when I see people particularly talking about depression or anxiety, not just in COVID times, but forever times. And then I'll say, and can't tell me about how you move your body, when do you exercise in any way? And I'm not talking leg warmers and a G-string, you know, I'm talking mm -hmm. just move your body, I like to call it, as opposed to exercise. Yeah. And often people say, I don't, I don't have time for that or I don't do that. It is the most powerful, potent, self-care ingredient we have is yeah. exercise for our mental health yeah. and yet some of us make the choice not, not to, to do, do it. it. So mm. these are simple tools, self-care, breath, breath for oh. a few minutes. It's also free. It's free. <laughs> it's free to breathe. It's free, free to, to move walk. your body. Mm. Um, animals. I mean, I'm spending a lot of time with my two dogs. I think the winners in COVID-19 are our four-legged friends. Absolutely. They're no longer experiencing separation anxiety and they're being walked 12 times a day <laughs> by everyone in the house that's going bananas looking for excuses to get out. Yeah. So if you're a dog, happy days. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, my dog's loving it. Um, how does someone manage feeling guilty working from home when they're not actually productive? Wow, okay, I love that question. Yeah, great question. Um, because I think one of my takeaways from today and from this experience is that I don't think it's useful or adaptive or healthy to have our primary goal as productivity at this time. How can we surrender so that productivity is not what we feel we need to be doing 24-7. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's appropriate not to be on the mad rush for productivity and output, but just to be in the moment. And that's what came up in what I read. They, you know, they, um, some of these things talked about just reading and listening and resting, resting. Who knew? I know, right? <laughs> but um, so I think the, the quest for productivity can be useful sometimes, as can distraction be useful, but sometimes it's important to just sit with ourselves and say, in this moment, productivity is not what's required. And I give myself permission not to strive for productivity and to find ways to sit with what's happening for me internally. Um, sorry, I'm just scrolling through questions because some of them have been answered. So one of the questions in here is around leadership. So there have been a number of leaders that have had to uh, manage challenges within their own teams. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden you have leaders that are sort of digging and finding out a lot more about what's going on in people's lives, which for a leader can be an actual heavy weight for them to carry while they're trying to manage a business, mm -hmm. as well as all of a sudden understanding a lot more about what's going on in their lives. What would your advice be 
to leaders that are trying to, you know, manage a business mm. that is, you know, suffering, mm. um, as well as managing a team that also have their own personal mm. challenges going on. I think there's a real opportunity there for leaders and their teams and staff and employees to connect on a human level. I think sometimes I mean, one of the things that's been really refreshing at this time is being on a Zoom chat or whatever it is, a video call, and I've literally seen five-year-olds doing nudie runs in the back of the house and, you know, partners walk in, grumpy partners saying, what are you doing? And them saying, I'm on the, I'm, I'm on, I'm on the work call, I'm on the work call. And so it kind of has given an insight, a window into how, how we all live. We're all flawed, we're all struggling. And for a leader, and we always have been, that's part of the human condition, for a manager or a leader to know that about their people is kind of refreshing that we see this whole person. Now, what I think is important for the leader is to acknowledge that they don't have to have all the answers. Yeah. They now know they've got this insight and this awareness that their people are struggling on, an, on a personal, emotional, psychological level. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that they need to step up and provide all the solutions. I think what's most important there is being able to acknowledge and to validate what that person's experience is without feeling the pressure to solve or fix because well, that's, that's beyond, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's outside of everyone's um, expertise and expectations. So use it as an opportunity to connect human to human and know that just being present to the person's experience is more important than fixing or solving it. Yeah. And I think maybe just finally, because I'm very mindful of the time, yeah. um, do you have sort of, and you probably touched on this a little bit, but it might be worth just circling back. Um, do you have any tips um, for getting on with somebody that you actually do have strains with? So, <laughs> in 10 seconds with a, with a set of steak knives thrown in. Um, okay, but well, literally in 10 seconds, one of the things I would say if you're with, so this is either someone you're living with or. Yeah, either, I'm guessing it's either, it's colleague, not specified, personal, either living with or potentially a colleague, yeah. You know, one of my top takeaways there would be to look for the commonality that you share. Because okay. when you're in a state of conflict with someone, whether it's your partner, your child, your colleague, your boss, your peer, your neighbour, um, it's so easy to shine the light on what we don't have in common and how mm. you're so different to me and how you wouldn't understand me because you and I are nothing alike. Yep. And if we're able to shine the light on what we do share, I think we build a level of compassion and empathy because we both want this family to be happy or we both want this team to be productive or we both want this neighbourhood to be harmonious. And how can we work from that shared space, the bit that crosses over between us as opposed to the parts of us that are worlds apart? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Sabina Reid, thank you so much for being on the couch with yeah. us today. It's been incredibly insightful and no doubt incredibly helpful to our community. Oh, that's great to chat. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So next Tuesday, we welcome Nadine Champion to the couch with Anne from Scene Change. She'll be coming to you from the Sydney studio. And Nadine's gonna talk about 10 seconds of courage, which is a powerful call to action that challenges people to change their thinking in order to create their own success. So make sure you jump on and register. Um, I'm sure there'll be a little bit of inter interactive activity with Nadine as well. Thanks for joining us today and we'll see you next week. Have a very safe and happy Easter as well.